Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 20 of the FamVestor podcast. I'm your host, Sonny Burns. And I'm your co-host, Sun Marie Burns. Today, we're excited because we are interviewing the first couple on this show. So it's going to be a couple-to-couple interview. Pretty cool. And they're a great couple, you know, very intentional with their lives, kind of reminded of ourselves, you know, buying a house hack as our first property. They didn't house hack, but they bought a flip, and they bought it for $30,000 and flipped it two years later, a live-in flip, for $130,000, so 100000 over what they bought it for. And sure, that's not just profits. You know, a lot of equity, a lot of materials, a lot of their own labor went into this. But uh, they did this over and over again, uh, doing four live-in flips, now owning 15 rentals. Um, so really cool story to dive into and very practical too. So like, yeah, great right, people. Right, a lot of great advice they share. Um, they're also parents of five kids, raising them, homeschooling them, and simultaneously running this rental business in which they do involve their kids. And we get into that discussion too and how they involve the kids in all the daily comings and goings of service calls and all the nitty gritty that goes into landlording, while also still living in and working on their flip, um, which currently is a a 140 year old farmhouse. House. I don't know right. if this is so much a flip, Maybe more, the more of their <laughs> forever home ish type for their family. Right. But yeah, definitely a really cool story. And what's really cool is that they don't work a full time job. You know, they're not dual income, they're not even full time single income. Jordan still works part time, but it seems more like it's for fun than a need. You know, he's already achieved financial independence, uh, but he's supplementing that a little bit with just working part time because it seems like he's doing what he loves. And he's even going for his doctorate, which I don't, I didn't just really understand. Just physics, for fun, I think. Yeah, I think he <laughs> wants to keep teaching his children, you know, continuous learning. And so definitely a cool couple, great show, really enjoyed talking with them, a great time. Uh, one thing we forgot to mention and include in the show, but they also have helped uh, three different buyers uh owner finance so they did they provided owner financing for three people that wouldn't have normally been able to buy their house and they say they always try to rent to people who can then buy a house you know because they want to help people you know start their own real estate and start their own empire so i love that about them i love their you know their just their whole planning and intentional aspect of how they live their lives right it's a great story very inspiring yeah so without further ado let's get to the show you're listening to the FamVestor Podcast. If you're looking to raise your family with intention, gain financial independence, and live a life of true freedom, you're in the right place. Join us as we explore together how to create thriving families, because strong families are the cornerstone for a world at peace. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fan Vester Podcast, episode 20. We're really excited today because for the first time on the podcast, we are interviewing another couple live here on the podcast, and we have... Jordan and Leah Clint, and their I don't know their story is really interesting to me. I heard their story first on the Bigger Pockets Money podcast, and I was like, I gotta get these guys on. These are everything that you know we talk about here on the podcast, all about family, finance, and freedom. But they're you know small town landlords, and they just landlord where Jordan grew up. And they have five children who kind of help them with their rental fix-ups and service calls. And Jordan retired to part-time work. You know, he's only 36 years old at this point, but he retired, I think, a year ago or a little while ago. And right now, they're working, they're living in and working on uh, restoring a 140-year-old farmhouse on 20 acres. Uh, so he has, he grew up kind of with a strong um, construction background. So we're going to definitely dig into that a little bit. Uh, and he's currently pursuing his doctorate, but what's interesting is he never even got his high school diploma. So really kind of want to dig into that. And, you know, it seems like they have a really good synergy between the two of them. So we're going to dig into how they, uh, you know, divvy up the roles as being landlords, as being flippers, and just, you know, raising a family of five kids and doing all of this in tow. So excited to dig deep with them here. Uh, there's just I asked them for a quick fun tips. So here are just some highlights that I definitely want to dig into. He bought his first house when he was 19 years old. They've done four live-in flips. And they've done a week-long vacation where they rented out their house on Airbnb. So they went on vacation for a week. And while they were gone, they rented it out. And they actually made more money than they spent on their vacation, which is awesome. Great and, planning there. <laughs> and then Jordan used to tow his lawnmower around with his bike in junior high to do his lawn mowing jobs, which visually is just really fascinating to me. And I, I see the drive and... Uh, Entrepreneurship from a young age. Right. So everyone, please, let's uh, welcome Jordan and Leah Clint onto the show. Oh, 
right. Thanks, man. That's, that's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. Thanks for being here and thanks for making the time. I know you guys have five kids. We're recording at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right now. So hopefully your kids are pretty well situated in bed like ours are hopefully trying to pretend to be asleep. <laughs> yes. we'll, we'll see if that works out. If one like, sneaks behind us, you'll know it didn't quite work That's out. That's okay. It's a family show. Kids can be included. Right. So, in regards to family, finance, and freedom, and the life you now lead, where does your origin story begin? Tell us about the beginning of your journey together. So we started dating when Jordan was just 19 years old and um, the beginning of our dating life was him looking through an actual newspaper and he found this $30,000 house in a nearby town that was called a handyman special. Uh, so his dad put up the money, um, bought the house. Uh, Jordan and his dad worked on it and I was included somehow at first all I was allowed to do was sweep and like they even complained about how I swept like it was a little too much flicking at the end or something so, so first but, date involved sweeping no our first date was Wendy's but um, nice. it was cheap uh, and but we did like we always worked on the house like our whole time that we were dating right and then eventually um, we didn't date for that long we dated like a year and a half we got married and we lived in that house oh, as nice. our first house so um when we moved in the kitchen wasn't fully functional so we washed dishes in the bathroom sink for a month or so not too long anyways and, and where do you guys live where was this house this was in saint joe michigan yeah so michigan. we're in michigan i guess i can do it this this way right here so we're way over here in michigan <laughs> okay yeah. that shows up right so we're right on the lake um Chicago is our nearest big city, but we're in Michigan, so we're we're like 63 right minutes from Soldier Field, basically. I can get there quicker than the north suburbs people can get there. Okay, and is a $30,000 house typical for that area? Like, our area is like $500,000 house. Uh, 30, house. Was, 30 was very, very low for a, yeah. a good area. Like, maybe a C-class, you could maybe still get... Well, not you can't get no. it now, but maybe back then you it could get it. It was the lowest you could pay yeah. for a house. Oh, okay. great. There so were raccoons really living in the house. When and you do, do you still own it today, or have you sold that? No, no, we sold that to finance the purchase of our next one. So back then we didn't, we didn't have a vision yet for what our long-term thing was going to look like at that point. So we kind of stumbled around for a little bit. And so, also yeah. we didn't have any money. We so, didn't have any money. Like, so we sold that and then financed our our next house off yeah. of that sale. How and quickly? Did that. How quickly was that sale? Uh, we did two years because you get the homeowner exemption on the on the the taxes. Can you explain that real quick? We never talked so, about that. I mean, I, I think it's nationwide, I think, but for sure for us, if you own a house for two years, you don't have to pay capital gains tax on the profits of that house up to like 750000 or something right. like that. Right. So you so, bought it for 30000 How much did you sell it for? Uh, we sold it for 131 mm -hmm. something like that, 134000 uh, Okay. So like a $100,000 gain, which you don't well, have to pay I mean, taxes some, some of that was materials. You we know. had right. about seventy into it. So okay. there was probably like we... His dad got thirty, and we got thirty, and we put the thirty down on our house. Sweet. That's wonderful. It was a great deal. We we've totally offered it to some friends, like, hey, we can do this deal, right? And, and actually, had one couple take us up on it, which was great fun. So, wow. yeah, that's so awesome. So, uh, at age nineteen, um, you said that your dad helped you in this, but where did the inspiration come from to get into real estate to begin? <clears throat> to begin. So. With? Um, I had seen I had seen the property values kind of kind of really jump. Um, we're in that that little bit of lake stretch right there. So the houses went from when I first knew what houses cost, they were you know some a number, and then they doubled probably in you know seven or eight years while I was paying attention. And I'm like, they just made a lot of money and they didn't do anything because the, the price just kept going up. So right. at one point, our neighbor's house sold for she was it was had never been updated it sold for like 79,000 I think is what it say it sold for those people bought it and essentially flipped it before flipping was a term I guess and they sold it for almost 300 in like three months wow. and I'm like this is crazy and I didn't know that that I, I didn't know about different areas having different percentages or anything like that but I'm just like if yes. that person can do it there's nothing stopping me from doing it that's one of the things I'm kind of a contrarian so if somebody says you can't do it, then for sure I can do it. If they say you can't do it, you know. It's so. a challenge you, just, you like to take up. Yeah, you just wanted a piece of real estate that was going to appreciate for you because that's what model you saw, and then it worked out for that first property. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it's worked out for all of them, I think. You know? So you've done yeah. four of these now in your... Yeah, we've done four live-ins. Um, okay. We've done probably another dozen or so where we didn't live in them. Mm-hmm. Where um, we virtually lived in them. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. We found that it's actually... Some people think it's harder to do them live-in. I think it's easier to do them live-in. In some ways. Because you're there. You know, you, you get, well, when I still work, you get off work and you come home and then you can put in two or three hours before dinner and then you can put in a couple hours after the kids go to bed. Right. But if it's off site, you got to drive 20 minutes and pack tools and unload tools, and that's right. less it's convenient. It's just not probably. on your mind when you're living yeah. in right. it. You see everything that you want to do, and it keeps you motivated. If it's yeah. a few miles away, it's it's you have to concentrate on what did I want to do over there. I know that feeling exactly. And even 10 minutes worth of work on a project actually gets the project done eventually. So you were really paying attention to the real estate market while you were in high school, which is pretty impressive. You know, I feel like a lot of high school students don't yet have, you know, they have the blinders on to real world uh, scenarios, usually, you know, they're in their own world. So here you are paying attention to rental markets, real estate markets. Um, It's a pretty bold move to jump into real estate. Did anyone else in your family prior to that do this, that you could look at their model as an example? Or was this truly your your inspiration, your dad, I, I want to buy a house. Um, yeah, uh, my dad had a rental that he had had. I mean, he had it for 40 something years or whatever. So he had it at that point, he had had it a long time, but he was not inclined like that. He just kind of stumbled into it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I, I saw that, I guess a little bit, but that, I don't think that was my real inspiration. You wanted to get married, and did your mom tell you? Yeah, you had I wanted. To have a house? We wanted to get married, and she thought that was kind of a step to looking more responsible. And I was still young in her mind, so I'm like, I gotta move this along and figure out how to make this go. So, was financial freedom? I mean, must have been right to do the hard no, work. No, no, that was not financial freedom. Wasn't even an idea at that point. Mm-hmm. We can talk about that. That came around. Uh, I would have been 22, I think, and I had this job, and I'm like, I can't do this job anymore. <laughs> But I, you know, we're broke. We're 22 or whatever. We're not even graduated at that point. Right. Uh, and it's like you got to do something. So I'm like, okay, I can stick this out for 20 years. I said I could stick it out for 20 years. So that's where really I set this artificial deadline, and I'm like, I got to come up with a plan in 20 years, and then figure out something else to do. No idea what that meant. Didn't know there was any other person in the world that had ever thought about it. Mm-hmm. You know, we didn't we didn't have the network or the resources or friends or anything like that that were inclined like that. So. Really, we kind of started off on that, like, okay, we got, now it's only 19 years left, we got to figure out a plan kind of thing. And we then, called it, we wanted to be done working for the man Yeah. Yeah. by the time he was 42. Yeah. So here you are, you're living in your first house, um, and it's, it's, it's going to be a flip. Um, you're, you're working on it, repairing it. Tell us about your journey now. How do you move forward? How do you make the decision to sell it and start buying more flips? Yeah, so that one was in a it was in a big city, we'll call it, you know, eight thousand people or ten thousand people or whatever. Uh, we didn't want to live in a big city with stoplights and things like that. So that was never part of the goal. Lights, yeah. uh, so we just did that and got you know, got those two years out of the way. Then we came back down closer to where, where I grew up or whatever. So probably twenty minutes from there, something like that. Uh, you know, moved back down to where we wanted to be long term. Mm-hmm. Found another old it was an old cottage that they had run just as a, like a fruit stand, basically. So they would stay there so they could farm the field and then take the, fr- the produce back to Chicago. Hmm. So it was all bedrooms and no like living space. And the kitchen was in the garage. And... <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So how we got much, that. And how then much we did you it... get that one for? Oh, we paid full price for it. Like that, we bought that in 05. So that was like peak. It's actually the house that's in this painting behind us. That was the, the <laughs> nice. there, so. Do you remember how much it was, though? I think that was 150 150 for it. We yeah. had seven acres, though, and it was a gorgeous place. We yeah, yeah. Total potential. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And you and got a mortgage was, on that, I assume? Yeah, we had, a, we had a regular mortgage, our down payment from the first flip. You know, our cash came from the, whatever, cash for the down payment came from that first flip. And then uh, we tore the roof off and put a second story on it. Wow. And a third story, I guess, technically an attic or whatever, two and a half. Wow, those are big projects. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, we just went for it. We we were trying to figure out, like, where an addition would go, and we couldn't come up with anything, and so we 
had this idea of turning it into like a colonial style box kind of looking thing. And it um, was perfect. And it was a gorgeous house. Turned out to be very beautiful. So, so I know Jordan's on board, you know, this was his idea, buy this house at 19, and then now you're rolling forward, and you know, you're, sw- you're swiping off to the second or third date. Uh, <laughs> did, like, when did you come on board with this idea? And like, did it take a lot to get there? Or you were pretty much like, hey, this is working out. And I don't mind coming home every night working on this house and repairing it. How was that for you? No, it was fun for us. Like, I don't, I was actually like, um, we lived in the house for about a year before we started the major renovation to it. And um, we just had big dreams. And so like we drew pictures all the time and like we came up with this plan of like how we were gonna make it look, get with the building inspector, like gave him our whole spiel, you know, this is what we're gonna do to it. And then we came up with a weekend where it didn't look like it was gonna rain for a week and just started tearing the roof off. Wow. And then actually, after that first week, it did rain for like eight solid days. I think it was 14 days. It rained. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the roof's horrible. off. <laughs> <laughs> well, the second floor was on, but we had tarped it and the water was coming in and I was pregnant with my first and I'm just like bailing out the roof in the middle of the day. <laughs> so you're still living in it with the roof off. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we had put plywood, mm-hmm. like we put the second Tarp floor plywood, plywood up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, it, for um, days. it oh, wasn't geez. like it was seeing the sky. We only saw the sky for about three days. And, and at that point, were you like, what have we done? I regret <laughs> ever doing this. Or were you like, oh, this is part of the territory. The vision is still there. And it's just a little hurdle we have to get past. No, I don't see the vision like quite as clearly as Jordan does. But like, I totally like if you would have seen what he did to the first house then you would have totally believed like he could do anything it was Mm. just like a total transformation so i just thought that he knew what he was doing i Mm -hmm. guess or Mm -hmm. hoped i guess i don't know we were we were in it then okay but you guys were together on it combined (laughs) mission combined purpose believed in each other and going forward yeah it was just really like it was what we did it was what we did for fun and it had been what we did for fun the whole time so our awesome. skill sets offset really well. I think that helps us mesh together really nice. What, what is the skill set? I'm so curious because Sunray and I kind of do the same thing. We have yeah. a really good synergy. So Leah's very much of the taskmaster, and she can make the list, and it'll have every single thing on it, and she'll schedule them and can lay them out and handles the you know the billing side and the payment side, and that's really where she strives on it. Mm-hmm. And then I have the creative skills and the vision and then all of the – Muscle and the hard work and the... And the big picture. The, the big, big picture, picture is yeah. super helpful because you don't... He doesn't get bogged down in, like... Um, the nitty-gritty details. Things, yeah. Well, I mean, there's details and stuff, but, like, always... Um, She'll make a list that has 500 items on it, and you can't do 500 items no. in, you know, in three months. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but then I'm like, these are the things that are important. we got to work on the important things. Yeah. Some of the, your list stuff will get done as we do the important stuff, and... Right. I think it meshes really well, and she slows me up sometimes, and I slow her up sometimes, and we speed <laughs> each other up. And... and it's not like we do, like, we work together good, but we have definitely have it out about stuff, too. But I think that's part of our thing. Like, right. we are we are both strong, like, strongly opinionated, and if I want it one way and he wants it the other way, we will have it out until we come to <laughs> an agreement about it. I think we wanted to be more vocal than our folks about that. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't like nobody was laying down. So we were we were gonna we were gonna decide to move forward together. And yeah. I think that was a key thing for us because we've kind of done it through all of our projects that way. Mm-hmm. Whenever we move forward, we've moved forward together. Like yeah. it doesn't go until it goes together. Right. I and mean, I think that's so important as a dynamic in any relationship. You know, if you're a husband and wife, you're married, you know, you you've gotta be able to work through things. You may not always agree, but you've gotta find a way to to find a compromise that works for both of you and i think if you can do that relationship wise and business wise then you know you can have success and i i've found time and again the couples who have success with their real estate journey and their entrepreneurial journeys the key comes from having that kind of synergy right and I mean, so many times when we're looking about like renovation and stuff, I always like high end, you know, let's make it last, buy something really great. And then somebody like brings me back to nature, like, okay, we don't need to buy that high end thing. You know, I found this great 
a uh, uh, lot of Craigslist used cabinets and let's just install those. They're just as nice the last 20 years. Let's do that. And I'm so glad that she brought me back and did that. And we've done that for like seven kitchens and just like, so yeah, at the time, you know, I was like, no, that's a terrible idea. Let's just do this. And, uh, but yeah, working together, coming with that common solution and has definitely helped so much. And we've seen that as throughout the years. So it's great to see it's in your couple. Right, too. and that you guys now trust each other with those skill sets. Still, you know, talk about it, argue, and fi- uh, find the best path forward. But that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So um, it sounds like you do a lot of the work yourselves. Do you contract work out? Uh, do you do the majority of it yourselves? And how I'm curious, that... you know, you were pregnant with yeah. your first on the second flip. Once the kids started coming, um, how did that change, that dynamic change? Yeah, so we do most of the things ourselves, whatever we can whatever we can really handle. Um, we don't do drywall because it's hard and it takes a long time. Uh, especially if you don't it do it good. all the time, it doesn't look good. Yeah, you got to do a lot of a lot of it to get pretty good at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we have a really good HVAC guy, so we do use him even on our, our own stuff. Mm-hmm. And then obviously with the rentals, we it's a little bit different with the rentals. Uh, We've started farming more of it out as we're able to... Um, kind of find people that we trust for certain things. Yeah. Right. And then we'll still do a lot of it ourselves, but we're, we're kind of trying to offload some of that so we can do our projects that are important to us here. Mm-hmm. And uh, how old is your oldest right now? And what are the ages of your kids? So our oldest is 12. She's going to be 13 next week. She'll be 13 next week. We're almost Five parents years. of a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, Scary. Um, then, uh, so we, then we have 11, 8, and then two, 5 and 4. Awesome. Wow. And yeah. how, I mean, maybe this is a bit early on the show, but how do those kids get involved? How do you involve them in this uh, part of your business? Well, we, so from day one, so our first was born when our house was definitely on, under construction. And we um, stumbled upon like a, a sleep training um, book mm-hmm. when we were um, new parents that one of our friends recommended to us. Well, it was you called, can, you can it's it. called yeah. Baby Wise. I think that some people like disagree yeah. with the ideas in it. I just um, had someone talking to me about that book yesterday. Okay, so the book is very <laughs> dated now. I think there's another book called The Healthy Sleep ha- Habits, Happy Child, which is along the same lines, but maybe a little bit um, looser. And it's like, this book is really like, you got to keep this schedule. It's really important for your kids' development. And we just kind of went with that and went with the ideas of that book. And it worked really well for our first kids. So we're like, hey, this is works good for us. So we would work when our kids slept and um, it worked out great. And then as she kind of grew, we had different ways of keeping her happy. Like she was in the pack and play sometimes and she was in a Johnny jump up, like hanging from the ceiling joist. And it just worked. And we were always just kind of like she was around it, you know, so she would pretend like she was hammering. (laughs) <laughs> anyways and then we always had we've always lived close by my in-laws so um they would help like if we had a weekend where we need to spend tiling or whatever they would watch the kids for us like the majority of that weekend so we could make a big push or something like that so yeah, we had great. a combination of good nearby babysitting and kids who could entertain themselves pretty right well so sounds very similar to our story because we bought our first uh, house for our property which was a four family and our in-laws moved upstairs so they were on premises but also i mean i we have so many videos of valen you know our eldest like not swinging hammers but he was he's in our rental properties at like open Just houses around. and they're shows around. yeah they're I feel around like if kids are around it then it's not quite so um foreign to them and right. you can teach them about like being safe or whatever like right. it's not really um yeah, our like first an kid. For every kid, but... our first kid, we ran the table saw inside. So like there was a tool room, and that was her nap room was the tool room. And we ran the table saw. <laughs> Not while she was sleeping. No, but I mean like <laughs> time to wake up, walking. little one. <laughs> she could she could sleep through a lot of construction. She you know? could. She, she, learned could. How, she, she probably still can sleep through a lot of construction yeah. actually. Yeah. And so then like once you get more and more kids, it gets more and more difficult. But right. now we kind of like pair off to do stuff so every time jordan goes on a service call he takes a friend so and we typically pay our kids for going on service calls so we pay five dollars an hour nice um and then five dollars a service call for the little ones because they're usually just along for like the taco bell pickup but yeah we don't we don't do any uh 
we don't do any allowance or anything like that. So all the money they get is earned or gifts, you know, whatever birthdays and stuff like that. So, so from the rental property business, that's their earnings. Yep. yep yeah. Yep. Fantastic. So they, they like to do it sometimes, you know, and then sometimes they think it's a real drag that they've got to go spend <laughs> Saturday or whatever working on the apartments. But right, it's, it's teaching them what some... we do. It's what we do. Yeah. Yep. And can you just describe, like, as a 12 year old, what is she capable of at this point? What has she done, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Um. So She's today. capable of a lot. Today we are doing walls. Uh, we're doing an addition on our house here. So we did walls today she on the second story. She Tyvek. So she yeah. did Tyvek. And she helped hold the walls while we were getting yep. it leveled. And, and painted. Uh, she was picking out paint colors for her room and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> that's, that's fascinating to me and something I'm actually looking forward to, you know, teaching those real world schools uh, skills yeah. to my children and having them learn that growing up and the real work ethic that comes with that. The work but ethic, have, the skills, we, yeah. We try to like get them to do grunt work and then tell them like, hey, you master sweeping and you can move on to like my next thing after sweeping was shoving insulation in between like the windows and right. then you can move on from that and eventually you make yourself so valuable that someone else is sweeping and not you, so. Mm -hmm. That's so awesome. And I love the, you know, the uh, how it allows you to not have to give an allowance and they can still make money because there's these yeah. opportunities where you, you need them or you could use their help. And, you know, even our son, who was like three years old, when three years old at the time, we had him wrapping quarters from our coin-operated laundry machines at our rental properties. And, yeah. you know, every time he filled a quarter sleeve, he got a quarter. And then you got four of those, you got to go to Walmart and buy a Hot Wheels car. So it's like right. really a cool, natural way to learn about money, experience getting and then spending and then saying, like, going to Walmart and being like, hey, I want that Mack truck. We're not buying it for you. You got to save for it. It's 20 bucks. It's going to take you a while. I yeah. think you've... you've um found the key to you know teaching your kids about money and that how you know it's not freely given but it's something you have to work for and i think that's an important lesson that a lot of times in modern times it's not really uh done right. in that manner it's kind of harder to find those tasks but i feel like it's a parent's responsibility and you're doing an amazing job with that i love the creativity there yeah awesome it does backfire eventually because they've saved up a hundred dollars and they don't have anything to spend a hundred dollars on. They're like, I'm not going to work today. I got a hundred dollars. Yeah, really. They're like, a hundred dollars? <laughs> they pay for anything. <laughs> they're like, we don't need any money. <laughs> We're not sweeping today, mom. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Um, so uh, walk us through your your flipping journey. Yeah, so I really love flipping. Um, I was mostly passionate about that in the beginning because I don't, I'm an engineer and I don't really want to interact with 20 tenants or anything like that. That was never my goal. So I always thought I'll fix that crappy bathroom once and then I'll never have to deal with it again because in, <laughs> you know, in 15 years, it'll be somebody else's. Mm -hmm. But then as our, as we matured, I guess, and developed and figured out, you know, how passive income actually works, it was like, oh, passive income is way better than you know, one-time income, mm -hmm. and it's taxed differently also, and it has a bunch of these advantages. So um, we're doing less flips, like way less flips now. So what we like to do is buy really distressed houses oh, yeah. that have things we can fix. Mm -hmm. So like if the house is in bad shape, but it has a bad roof, Jordan can fix a roof. So we will re-roof it, and we get it for a really good value that way. And then we put and a bathrooms renter in and it. kitchens and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, stuff we can handle. You know, we, we like a certain kind of house. And then um, we like buying it at a certain kind of price. So if we and find those two. That's that 1%. Uh, we don't even go look at a place unless it'll pass the 1% just on paper. Mm -hmm. And what is the 1% real quick? So 1% is, uh, if we'll use 100,000 house, uh, I guess. It might not translate for everybody. But uh, if the house is a, after repair, Value your cost after repair cost is a hundred grand. It needs to rent to for a thousand dollars. Right, and if it was two hundred thousand, it would have to rent for two thousand dollars. Yeah, right. so that's the one percent rule. It comes out to uh, eight point three ROI, something like that. I think is what it comes out to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're doing these flips, and then you find out, hey, you know, actually, instead of just doing these one-time cash outs, you want recurring uh, income coming yeah, yeah, in through yeah. rental income. Um, when how, when did that kind of happen for you? Were you like four flips in, five flips in? Um, yeah, we, we had just finished the second one and we were looking for what the third one would be. 
And it was like, uh, let's stay in stay in this house and let's not sell it right away. So the, we never talked about it, I guess, but the plan was to sell that second house probably sooner than we ended up doing. But then we just, we kind of liked it, you know, and it was really nice and a great area and we liked the neighbors and stuff like that. So we ended up staying in that one and not moving again for a while. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, what's the next thing we're going to do? So then we found a foreclosure in the bottom of the recession. Like, okay, we'll try a foreclosure, you know, and it was in pretty rough shape, I guess, mm-hmm. and dirty and dated and all those kind of things. But those were stuff we could fix. And we mm-hmm. got a renter in that one and said, okay, we'll let it just rent for a while and then we'll figure out what to do with it. Mm-hmm. And that's really when that passive income started to click. Mm-hmm. So that was in like 2009, yeah. that first That was rental? 2009, yeah, January of 2009. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and- so our net worth was negative in January of 2009. I still have all the spreadsheets to track that. Because you had bought a $150,000 house and then after the recession it went down. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, so that was, we had like a negative net worth, but we still managed to pull out, you know, another rental property. So we did that. You were um, birth working full time or once you had your first baby, uh, Leah, did you stay home? Jordan, did you stay home? What was yeah, so Leah, Leah, we were working full time for probably a year and a half. Yeah, something like that. And then every time we had another kid, Leah worked a little bit less and then a little bit less and then pretty soon none. Mm-hmm. And I was after three kids, you went down to none? After Pepper. Oh, you, you... I quit after Pepper. So okay. after the fourth kid, okay, I and... went down to none. But I worked a long time for two days a week, basically. Okay. And the whole time, uh, once you quit, were you helping out more with the rental properties or is mostly geared just towards the kids? So um, my primary job with the rental properties now is uh, property management, but I do most of that, you know, like here and there. So I take care of stuff at the time. I let contractors in, you know, at the time. So like meet people, like find renters and things. So I kind of fit it in with everything and then um, spend the most of the most of the day during the school year working on school. But I kind of try to get my kids to do stuff and then I work on our rental stuff if I need to. So I'm trying to get my kids to do their work independently. Or you step down work you step down work to pick up Yeah, to pick up property management stuff. No more kids stuff. I mean Oh that was the well, reason yeah, why. because we couldn't leave our five yeah. kids with my mother in law <laughs> Right. <laughs> and and it used to be a lot of kids. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you I wanna because you guys are up to fifteen units of that's this point, right? No now we are. We yeah. bought um we bought six units this February. So we oh, were wow. up to like nine um before that. And property managing for other people. And I was doing some property management for other people. And we've had some properties where we've bought them and then we've held on to them for a while and we've sold them to a friend or we've sold them to... And we did those land contracts too that I don't, yeah. I don't know if we'll talk about those land contracts. Yeah, I'm interested because so I don't even know what land contracts are, but go ahead, yeah. We have kind of all we kind of always have a project, but we kind of try to do one project at a time. Right. So if we're working on a rental, we're working on that rental and everything else is a little bit on autopilot. Awesome, mm-hmm. yeah. So I see my role as more of the paperwork side, but I'm always kind of working on the one you're working on with yeah, you, yeah. just not as much as I used to be able to. Okay. Mm-hmm. How much? Okay, so let's go back to 2009, your first rental. That was a single family. How much did you buy it for? Like 59 or 60? 60, right around 60. And then when did you buy your next? The next year, the next i think we bought two, we bought two on accident. accident at the same time yeah <laughs> and one then... was a short sale one was an auction they end up closing on the same day which was a little bit of a surprise but we made it work wow <laughs> closing on the <laughs> same day jeez wow. the short sales the short sale was slow it was so slow to develop so we thought it wasn't going to happen yeah okay so it's 2010 you now have three units what, yep. what happens yeah. next um let's see 11 in 2011 no 2010 i the factory I was working at, I was an engineer working at a factory. They said they're moving to South Carolina. And we're like, we're not moving. No, North Carolina. Yeah. Oh, wow. Maybe South Carolina. We might have moved to South Carolina. <laughs> not North Carolina. Uh, <laughs> we're moving to North Carolina. And I'm like, no, we're not, we're not going to move. So then it kind of changed. Like, okay, what are we going to do now that I don't really have a job? And that was still pretty much in the recession. That would have been fall of, fall of 2010, something mm-hmm. like that. So it was still a little bit. You know, the sky is falling out there. People were nervous. Right. So they're like, you get a, uh, you're going to get a severance if you stay till the till the end. It was going to be a big number. And like, well, what are we going to do with this severance or whatever? So I went and bought another house with the severance. Probably, <laughs> probably it was a little risky or whatever. But 
So that's, it's, it's our best house. It's our best house. So. It's our great. Yeah. It's a great house. Yeah. What is so. that house? Uh, it's a place. So um, everything. There's one highway that runs along the coast, the um, Lake Michigan here. Sure. And everything on one side of that highway is double the price of everything on the other side of the highway. Okay. Hmm. So everything closer to the beach is oh, double the price, it. basically. Yeah. So this was a house that. In the, in the recession, bad, in the recession, but it was on the right side of the highway, yeah. right? And it just has turned out to be a cash cow for us. It's yeah. a really great house. It's a rental for you guys still. Yeah. It's a rental yeah. for us still. We've thought about turning it into Airbnb, but um, Airbnb is a little more hassle than I want to deal with, and right. our numbers on the rental are pretty good. How much did you buy it for, and what is it renting for? We bought it for ninety nine. We ended up putting another like twenty five into it, and it rents for 13, around thirteen hundred. Okay, so around that 1% rule, a little over. The but weird thing worth, about that, it's worth way more. That's the problem. It's worth close to 300000 probably. Oh, geez. So. so it's doubled in value or more than doubled. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because it was a good house before. It just looked bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. So are most of your rentals single family? Or do you have any duplexes? Uh, we got one. Okay, let's see. We have one that's a not a duplex. It's two units on one piece of property. Mm-hmm. So two, two houses families. on one lot. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then we got one apartment that's a, a five unit. Okay. Wow. That's the one we just purchased this spring. Oh, okay. wow. With a house. Commercial. I guess it's five in the house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Not exactly commercial. No, no but <laughs> right over the four family. <laughs> right, yeah. right. So having yeah. done both, do you recommend like people just start with buy and holds since that seems to be what you're doing now? Or do you still think that flipping is good and depending on your situation? So here's the, the thing with flipping. Uh, it's a head versus heart thing. So I still love the flipping. I mean, that's what I actually like, like. Mm-hmm. But I want more of the passive income. So we're pushing more on the passive income. Um, I would still probably... I'd still consider doing a, a big flip even or a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, it just, when you do most of the work yourself, you can only do, you know, I mean, you'd be hard pressed to do more than one a year. Right. So it's like, you just gotta, you gotta commit. And I think people over, over yeah, improve yeah, yeah. and then they lose their profit margin. Mm. So that's what happens with people. I think that are doing their first flip or their second flip. Mm-hmm. If you don't, if you don't quite know what you're doing, then I feel like you can way over improve and, and lose all of the profit that you have. There. I taught her that I had to build her a nice spreadsheet. So I built up <laughs> the spreadsheet and showed her how, you know, you get, you get better margin as you go up, but eventually you tip over and you start getting worse margin when you're putting in more because she always wanted to go. I do. I want a really high end yeah. house. But I'm yeah. like, we can make the same if you go low, at, you know, on this other side of the curve. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah. that really changed. That changed her view of flipping. And then it kind of changed our view of flipping together because we focus more on the, uh, the And I feel like you have flow. to have the right temperament to be a landlord. And um, we have a pretty good system worked out for us. Mm-hmm. Can you explain that system? Because I feel like, you know, getting the right tenants, that's the biggest thing that makes a good landlord or or a good experience or a bad experience. Mm-hmm. And it I think I'll start with saying our system works for us, but mm-hmm. I we're having trouble scaling it. That's the hardest part. Yeah. Okay. So it, our system doesn't go to 200 units. That's mm-hmm. still our system right now. So we're trying to work through some of those growing pains. A little of what we built got us here and it was great. But now we have to kind of tweak it to go to the to the next step, whatever the next step is. But we're we're trying to work through some of that, so we're trying to be more intentional about some of those decisions. But it doesn't. It's not gonna. It's not gonna take us to thirty or forty units or something right. like that. It and gets, I really don't want to be yeah. the main person, the main contact person on forty units no. either. Right. It's a lot of work. I don't want to be the contact on any of them. I don't. I don't give out my number to the tenants or anything. I have one tenant that. Well, I mean. I run, I run into one of my tenants a lot, and I'm always like, nope, you got to tell Leah. You can't tell me. You, call, you tell me. You got to call Leah. Use the channels. Use yeah. the right channels. <laughs> okay, so how about in terms of finding your tenants, what does your process look like? So originally, we had no idea what we were doing, and we put a sign in the yard, which is a horrible way, at least locally for us. Everybody calls, and they're like, that's so much money. You know, I could buy a house for less than that. I'm then like, well, go, go buy, buy it. I don't care. Like, what doesn't matter to me? Um, so we, we gave up a sign. I still have it somewhere, but we haven't put it out in probably eight years or something like that. 
We used Craigslist primarily for probably about six years. And then the last three or four, we've been using more Facebook Marketplace. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then currently the rental software that I use will um, send it to a lot of different sites. So it'll go on Zillow and it'll go on apartment.com and Rent different com. places that'll send me the leads. What do you use? Um, I use Rent Tech Direct. Okay. It's a uh, Oregon based, I think. It's yeah, awesome. We it's we really great. like it. We've been with them since it was free. Like we were the we're customer <laughs> yeah. number three. Are you, are you <laughs> grandfathered in? We are. We no. are not. No, no. <laughs> no. We pay for what we use, but oh, we've been really there forever. Yes, yeah, so it's me. been it's been really good. Okay. And they they're increasing functionality, you know, functionality, and then we take advantage of it slowly. We don't. We're so, not early. So your tenants pay early. online through that system. Yeah, they do. Okay. Most great. of them do. Some of them still, um, I give them the option of depositing the money at the bank in case they're like leery of online paying systems because some of them are. And so some of them use that system as do well. Do you guys have any like strict criteria? Like we do 620 credit score above. You got to make two and a half mm -hmm. times the rent and gross income. Do you so got... yes, those are my two. So I have three times rent and income and um you have to have a 600 credit score and i really don't bend on those two right and i have people who give me really really good stories oh also no more than two people per bedroom so okay. if i'm renting a two bedroom house there can be no more than four occupants mm -hmm. okay anything else that sticks out to you that you do the pet charge i do char we do allow pets in everything except for the apartments up to two pets and i charge 50 dollars a month extra Okay. For people to have pets. And have you guys ever had to evict? We have. Check out the pet thing before you go in your state because it's different yeah, for every state. Our state allows it. Okay. So, for what it's worth. Um, we have not had an eviction. We've had people that we have um, encouraged to leave mm -hmm. in a friendly way, I mm -hmm. guess you'd say, but we have not ever had to do a full on eviction. Okay. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yeah. Goodness. It sounds horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how you guys are sharing numbers, but how, I mean, how much are you netting from these 15 units in passive cash flow? I don't know if we know that. Our, our, we... uh, I want to go back and one, one. Would you mind sharing what you're grossing? I'm not sure if I know that number either. <laughs> okay. we're, we're trying to get better. We're trying to get a better system. Uh, so we're working with some, um, some financial, financial planners, planners to actually, plan, like, planners to actually come are. up with it. We have okay. a spreadsheet and I have, we just don't, we don't track it that way. I right. Guess. It's, I guess it's just working for you. Places. It's working for you cash guys flow. are accumulating uh, assets that are growing in equity that your tenants are paying for. So it's just uh, all good. Yeah, the appreciation, we don't count the appreciation. Like, that's not something that we're really going for. We're really just driving cash flow. I want units that appreciate, but we're not, that's not our main thing. And that's not what we try to drive the business on. So we try to drive it on cash flow. Um, you're, again, with that 1%, you're going to be really safe at that 1% numbers. I don't know what it is in your area or. One, if we can, if you can make one percent in area, you're doing really good. Yeah. But it's it's so you're, hard you're to find those deals. You're going to be super safe at one percent. That's yeah. what I tell. We have there's one realtor that comes around is always trying to get me to buy something that he's got, and it won't do the one percent. And I'm like, no, I can't do it. He's like, you'll still make money. I'm like, well, you'll break even by my calculations, and I don't want to break even. That's not my goal. So we're pushing for that cash flow. Right. So yeah, we do. I mean, we I don't know what numbers you actually should say or whatever. I make more. I make more uh, in the in the rental income than I do in all of my engineering work. Still, so. Mm. So uh, where we left off, you had lost your oh, job yeah, because your company had had relocated. You bought another property, um, and now here we are, fast forwarding a few years, and you have fifteen units under your belt. Um, are you are you back at work full time, or are you finding the the rental properties to have been profitable enough that you didn't have to go back to work full time and Leia also you are I guess staying at home now with the children and I believe homeschooling right so I still worked a couple days a week but I worked afternoons and then um the way that uh it worked out with our child care and stuff I would leave for work and Jordan would bring the kids home from his mom so that always worked for us Oh, nice. Uh, this is the 2011 we're talking? Yeah, so Jordan ended up getting a job at the hospital and yeah, yeah. Uh, worked as like process improvement engineer, which was a job he did not love, but um, he did it. I had to wear a year. suit and I had to like keep my hair trimmed and <laughs> shave every day. So that wasn't going to work for me long term. Uh, so for those who are just listening, how many inches long is your beard? 
Um, it's like 11 inches long, probably. Maybe a no, foot. It's, yeah, it's longer than that. Is it? What, what's the goal with the beard length? Right here. It, I don't trim it. I just I just cut the split ends. That's all you do. And I don't like wash it really unless I'm in concrete. It's a little bit of conditioner. No beard shampoo oh, in there? <laughs> no, you don't want to put too much product in there. Okay. It'll spoil it. Minimal right. product. Yeah. Concrete is really beauty. bad. Concrete and drywall, they're rough <laughs> in the beard, though. So I will shampoo after concrete. Drywall is bad, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I got the whole, I got the, you know, Swedish look going on or whatever. I'm an actual Viking, so yeah, you that. No. So but I no, can that, see a that job a that requires bit... you to shave is definitely not your scene. He didn't was... have the beard back then. Uh, well, I had a shave. Beard. Yeah. So I couldn't have the beard. So that definitely told you, you need to find financial freedom. Not financial freedom. No, that wasn't, that wasn't it yet. Um, I didn't know. We, we still didn't know what we were doing. And we were a little, we're pretty conservative. So the recession, you know, had us a little nervous, mm. I guess, still, even at that point in whatever that been, 11 or whatever. Yeah. So I did get back into manufacturing. That's what I had done most of my career. I ended up back there in a really good job, a small family owned company. Uh -huh. um, and then I like the job. I like the job and I like the people and stuff like that. But then at one point they made a business decision that I thought was a very, very bad business decision. Uh, and I proved to be right, but, uh, uh, that really was what motivated us to really push the business, which was just a hodgepodge at that point. It didn't really have a goal, but it said, we're going to make this, we're going to make this a passive income or, you know, whatever. I still, we're still involved. So, right. We call it passive. It's, it's not, not so it's passive. not exactly passive when you're involved. So we so. thought if we had seven houses paid off and that he house. could retire and our house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we thought we were debt free with seven rentals. Mm-hmm we would be able to retire. And um, then we ended up with more rentals than that and not all of them were paid off. So I'm not like where we hit the goal is a little fuzzy, mm -hmm. but it was um, March of 16. March of 16 is when we hit our goal. Mm -hmm. And then we were, I guess you say you're 81% now or whatever. Is that how close you are? 91% after our last four unit we bought. Nice. There you go. Good 91. Job. So you're 91%. We were 100% there in March of 16. Nice. So then I went in and told my, my boss, and I waited till August because I was slow, I guess. <laughs> so I waited till August and then said, hey, we got to make a change. You know, he knew, he knew what I was doing, but not exactly where we stood on that, you know, how close we were and stuff like that. So, so, so just for the listener's sake, so 100% would mean that if, if your expenses were $100,000, that you have 100000 of passive income coming in to cover all those expenses, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We try to keep our number way lower than that. Though. Yeah, <laughs> no, same here. Otherwise, we would not be at 91% right now. <laughs> right. It was a really... Much smaller number. <laughs> yeah, and then we, were, a... we always knew we could go back. So Leah still kept, she she was a nurse originally and she keeps her license up. Mm -hmm. And then I'm an engineer and then I have other skill sets as well. So if even if like things went really bad and we had 50% vacancy or something like that, we can always drum up additional work. That's never, that was never going to be a concern. Yeah, so that really enabled us to really push it. Um, after I did go in and say I needed to step down, you know, they said, could you stay on another year and finish this big project? And I, I of course said yes, cause I'm softy, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I do. So I stayed on another year full time. Uh, and then we went down to part time mm -hmm. and it's been part time for a while. There's some, eventually, you know, if we do ever have that one where we do the uh, bike episode or whatever, we got some <laughs> other stuff we can talk about. We're not, we're not quite ready to talk about the other stuff yet. We're still in the middle of some stuff. Okay. Um, but there will be some changes coming up that we'll be pleased to announce. All right. Um, yeah. We'll have to have a follow-up episode. Yeah, not quite ready to announce anything. So sure. so I'm just curious for my own own sake, because, you know, I'm getting close to that 100% number, and I'm kind of thinking, like, 125, when I reach, like, 125% financial uh, independence. Yeah. You're going to change I'm... your number. Always change your number. Yeah. <laughs> no, but at that point, I think I'm going to seriously be like, okay, this is now the time to really leave my job. But it's so hard, you know, like, currently I'm making $105,000 a year as a government engineer, and I'm like, to say goodbye to that would be, like, you know, like kind of a very difficult decision. How was that for you? Like, was that well, like you don't huge? have to say goodbye to all of it. That's one of the things. Yeah. You can become a consultant. Yeah. You can work part time. If you have any skills, they can transfer to other businesses. If you drive down the street, every single shop's got a sign out saying they need somebody. So, I mean, there's ways to make, make yourself relevant, even if it's not in 100% capacity. I'd say that. Also, I'd say ever since we've gone down, you know, I started to cut back my hours. 
we've made more money because mm. you have more time to actually do the things that you're more productive at. So I'm not a sit around kind of guy. Right. Uh, I imagine that comes out. Right. And you but, realize like the, eventually you realize the lowest paying part of your life is your W2 employment. Mm-hmm. And you, I feel like we've begun to see the trade off there yeah. and just aren't willing to make the trade off anymore. Right. And it's not as secure as people think it is. So, I mean, stuff happens and people get let go and, you know, you lose a contract here or there, you know, and stuff changes. So that's one of the things that not as stable as you think it is. And you probably could do better on your own. I mean, if you're if you're handy like that or whatever. Right. Or so I kind of want to go into kind of your your family and how like the freedom kind of plays out in like the growing your family and you know raising them. But I do want to reach back real quick to back when you were 22, you said you had a job you hated and that kind of instigated this idea of financial freedom and drove you to that goal and what what was that job? Why did you hate it and what what was the process, the mindset that you developed after? It's that? a very good very good point. One of the things I was going to say is that you can't hate your job. So <laughs> you call it the hating um, I had a, I had a boss that was he was trying to challenge me, and I was I didn't really relate to the way he was challenging me. I think, and on some of the work, I didn't get the purpose of it. So one of the th- one of the projects I did, we had a big color plotter, um, you know, like a thirty six inch plotter that could print printer, you know, yeah, 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 giant, a giant old school one, you know, from the eighties or whatever, um, and it cost a lot to print in color. So they would print it in black and white and then they would give me a bunch of highlighters and say, now <laughs> highlight the sections that we wanted to print in color, which isn't obviously cheaper. And I'm like, this is So this you're paying me gross. $40, $60 an hour to do this. Okay. Yeah. So it was like 15 at the time, but $15 okay, okay. an hour. Oh, 22, was 22. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was still in school. Uh, right. I got a job while I was still in school. So this was a job while I was still in school. I think it was a it was a development that. job to try to get experience, you know. It's a coloring book. They pay you to d- draw a coloring book. Adult yeah, coloring yeah. books, right? That's people buy those nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it wasn't it wasn't that. It was just it felt like such a long haul, and it felt like such little income hmm. compared to what the potential was. You know, right. I I knew that I was eventually going to make more than fifteen dollars an hour. Mm. Maybe coloring was the best thing I could do at that point. I'm not sure. So. <laughs> That's kind of just what drew what drew it. Also, I knew I didn't want to, like like Leah said, it's working for the man. We didn't want to work for the man. We wanted to build something and put your own thumbprint on it. When you work for somebody else, you know you you can get some of that that personal reward out of it, but it's different when it's your own thing and you you know you stamp it on there and say mm-hmm. that was something I did. Mm-hmm. So it's a different it's a different way to look at stuff. For sure, but you're 22 years old, and you know, like 11 years later or 12 years later, you reached this financial independence goal. I'm sure was there. Did you write yeah. down like, hey, 10 years from now, I'm gonna be financial independent, so I don't have to do this if I don't want to, or what? No, what? it was supposed to be at 42. So yeah, I was 33 when we hit our number or whatever. Originally, nice. the goal was 42. Um, we didn't have any like halfway cutoffs. We didn't we didn't know what it meant. Right. And also, we thought we, 42 was a stretch, honestly, when we said that. We did our thing like exactly the right time. Like we started buying houses when they were extremely cheap. Right, right. So like for us, we had some very good luck mm-hmm. that we took advantage of. Right, so, awesome. The opportunities were there and we knew what we what we wanted to go and we yeah. did it. So tell us about your life today. You have this freedom, you have this extra time. Of course, you have a lot of... Uh, rental properties you're keeping up with and doing property management for as well. But I'm sure it's opened up time and space to do a lot of the things you're passionate about in life. Right. We're hearing all this work. You're working hard and it's work you seem to love and enjoy creating these great products for people to live in, these great homes. But I'm sure in your personal life, it's opened up a doorway for all of the passions like traveling or you know outreach just raising your children raising your what is yeah. what, is, what is, how is your life that. different than the average person how has what you've done all the work you've done enabled that um so now that you know i don't i don't have to work all the time or get to work when i want or whatever you want to say the uh i do help out a lot more with the schooling uh that's something we do when it's in in school season i guess uh we, i hadn't done any of that before because i wasn't home and i was pretty booked up um, so that's that's nice, and that's a little bit relaxing, and it's a little stressful, obviously. And there's a lot of kids. There's a lot of kids. And somebody's <laughs> always got a major problem, you know. So, um, 
So we've done some of that. Uh, I did go back to school. That's when I started to go back to school again for mm-hmm. my doctorate or whatever. Uh, so that Wait, was just... can, can you just explain that? <laughs> Sorry to keep interrupting, okay. but you have no high school diploma and you're getting a PhD. How does that work out? Yep. Yeah, uh, it's technically not a PhD. It's a doctor of business administration. So okay. it's a little okay. bit different, but yeah. Um, I went to engineering school, Kettering University. They had a great internship program where you work and go to school at the same time and it's a requirement. So that really set me up. That was that job that I wasn't sure I wanted or whatever. It was while I was still in school um, because I had gotten my credits or whatever. I didn't need to keep it. Uh, So that's how that went. I did go back and get my uh, MBA as well because I thought that was a good way to make me more versatile. We wanted to stay in this area, um, you know, Southwest Michigan or whatever. But uh, most of the manufacturing jobs were going away. You know, coming out of the NAFTA stuff, a lot went away in the you know late 90s. And then out of the recession, we were worried that more would just go away. Mm. And that's what my background had been in was manufacturing. So I was like, I got to diversify out of manufacturing. Mm. So I figured if I had that MBA, then some bank would hire me or a hospital or something like that. So okay. um, now off air, you explained to us how you managed to get into college without a high school diploma. But... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how did um, that work out? And yeah. That's it was it was called dual enrollment is what they called it when I was young. Now they around here they call it something else. Early middle college is what they call it here now. Uh, dual enrollment was I started in my junior year. I was homeschooled all the way up uh, K through twelve. Mm-hmm. Um, but in junior year of high school, I started taking some classes at the uh, community college. That's just up the road, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, about half classes there and then half classes still at home. Mm -hmm. And then senior year, I did that as well. Then I still needed a few more credits. So I did one year at the junior college and then I had my associate's degree. Mm -hmm. So you got your associate's degree before GED or anything? Yeah, I never got a GED and I technically never graduated. So interesting. But I mean, (laughs) it's just a technicality. I did all my coursework I was supposed to do, so. But Kettering accepted him with the associate's They assessed degree. me on the associate. So I transferred an associate's over there, which counts as two years of, you know, of the four-year degree as well. Fantastic. So. And what do you guys think? Because you guys were so smart with this. You know, you guys both had two associate's degree, two bachelor's degree, and you were able to graduate with $21,000 in student loans. What do you think of these days? I hear all these people graduating with six figures in student loans. Like, what would you say to those people? Don't do it. You've made some bad mistakes, I guess. <laughs> so what would you suggest? Just do the community college thing or what? So, I mean, it's easy to say now when I have my bachelor's and my master's and work on my doctorate, but eventually degrees aren't going to mean as much as they, they did. So, you know, our parents' generation, it meant so much. Mm-hmm. And that's why they encouraged all of us to go out and get them. Well, they meant less to us. And now I think, especially if, if things keep turning around, you know, we have, we have so you know, people are, there's so much openings out there, job openings everywhere. And you just take what you can get at Mm -hmm. some level. So if you have the abilities that, uh, that, you know, actual places are looking for people that hire people, if you can do what they need, they're not going to care as much about a degree. Mm -hmm. Like I got a really good job with a nursing degree because it was a technical degree in a field where they need people. So Mm -hmm. I did that with a two-year degree, and that was actually after my bachelor's degree, which is in yeah, bio. She did, them, she did them backwards. <laughs> mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. my first degree was not useful for finding a job, but my second degree was amazing for finding a job, and it was the less expensive, shorter yeah. degree. So I, so I, I love the... focusing on a career path mm-hmm. instead of a school would be smart. I right. love the technical degrees. I love the two-year degrees. Even the four-year degrees that have that same, you know, some kind of hard something to them. I'm very hard thinker, I guess. So, you know, accounting, engineering, those are still good degrees and you can still pursue those. And even if you you come out with a hundred grand worth of engineering degree debt, you're going to be able to pay it off. I mean, engineer employment's like unemployment for engineers is one and a half percent or something. Right. That's that's very wise advice, you know, picking... Picking a path and a school path that is directly correlated with a career path rather than. And then the stuff like the stuff that Mike Rowe does is amazing. The stuff uh, with welding and robotics and things like that. You don't need a good degree in that stuff. And those Mm -hmm. jobs pay really good nowadays. That's true. There's so many amazing fields you can get into that don't even require a college degree. Just high school or trade school. Uh. Um, yeah. yeah. So I'm curious, like, what is your perspective with your children? You know, are you pushing them towards college? Are you saving for college? You know, I know so many coworkers are all like 
maxing out their 529s or put it contributing as much as possible. What is your guys' perspective on it? And uh, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, like allowance, we are not saving for our kids' college. Uh, we expect them to manage some of that stuff on their own and make good decisions, and that's going to be their first real chance. Mm -hmm. We're hoping we put them in a good spot by the time they get there where they're capable, and we hope we still have a good enough relationship where they'll you know, let us give some advice still. But mm -hmm. no, that's the, we, it was on our own. We had to do it. It's yeah. going to be on our kids' own. We um, made different choices than our friends because we had to pay for college ourselves. So same here for both of us, yeah. That was a really good learning yeah. experience for us and one that our parents helped us with, like mm -hmm. as far as guiding us, but did not pay for. So right. I think that we're trying to do that yeah. for our kids as well. Yeah, I think the ownership that comes from it, all of a sudden the stakes are a lot higher on you as an individual yeah. to really pick something that is going to result in something worthwhile in your life rather right. than just doing it because everyone's doing it. I'm yeah, my bachelor's was at a relatively party-free engineering school, mm -hmm. but you could still tell on Friday night who was paying for their degree and whose parents were paying. <laughs> uh -huh. And I didn't want to be on the, the wrong side of that line. Oh, so, right. yeah, we I don't think we'll push our kids into college. It will not be something that we'll require. Uh, I'd much rather them have a path. Like, if they come away with a path, then we're going to be okay with that. Right. If it is college, we're going to be okay with it. If it's not, we're going to be okay it's if they don't have a path, then we'll have to work with them and be like, well, you're going to have to find a path. Right. I'm, you know. I'm curious to know if you push your kids towards savings or anything, or it's like your money that you earn, you get to do whatever you want with. And also, do you do anything with Roth IRAs now that, that they're earning money by helping out with the business? We haven't done the Roth IRAs yet, um, but we do like that idea. Uh, we do have them save. They save... I don't know what it is. It's about like a third of what they make. Probably, yeah. We make a big deal about going to the bank and putting money in, mm -hmm. and um, our kids respond to that pretty well. They and each have their own bank account. Yeah. They each have their own bank account. They and we pay them an artificially compare. high interest rate. So we pay them a really good interest rate rather than what the bank pays. So okay. we actually supplement the interest rate so they can yeah. see it compound. We really mm -hmm. want them to see the compounding. And at, you know, 0.75, it's hard to see the compounding right. or whatever. <laughs> right. And then we try to, keep, like, my, especially with my older daughter, she's 12, you know, and she has a lot more opportunities to spend money probably because she ends up out with her friends or whatever. You know, they stop by after a swim meet and want to get lunch or whatever. And I just tell her, like, just don't have more than 20 bucks on you at any time. Mm -hmm. Because then, you know, the more money you have on you, basically the more likely you are to spend money. Right. Mm. So just encourage her to put everything except for that 20 bucks, you know, in the bank or whatever. So Yeah, so we try to encourage them to save about a third and then we do we do donations to the, you know, to the church as well mm -hmm. and then we support a mission in in our community or whatever that I'm on the board of and mm -hmm. I make sure my kids are heavily involved in that and we try to give nice. back there. Mm -hmm. So time and money there as well. Yeah, Fantastic. so we're encouraging to be, we're trying to encourage them to be smart with their money. And we talk about like our business and we talk about actual numbers and like houses and how much it costs for like renters to pay us to live there and what that money goes for. So they don't think that we're like, like we know what, when renters pay us, that's not like money in my pocket. That's money that goes to, you know, pay off the debt on the place and right. pay for the repairs on the place. And we try to talk about that with them. And I'm not sure that they totally like, Grasp I don't know, them. they'll like throw out numbers of what they think stuff costs sometimes that are so off. And I'm like, oh, you've <laughs> not been listening at all to what I'm talking about. <laughs> but then sometimes it seems like they're getting it. So it's kind of like, you know, they're we're trying to have that conversation around them. So uh, just from a practical aspect and like the, how it works, like, so you said like you pay your kids $5 for a service call. Do you actually like, okay, at the end of the service call, you hand them $5 and does it, you take a third away from that and put it into the bank? How does that actually work? So it depends on the kid's age. Okay. With the younger kids, we definitely do hand them the $5 and have them put it like in their wallet or whatever. We don't usually take money away from it at the time mm -hmm. like that that's going to go in the bank. We just kind of collect like have a bank day and everybody puts the money that's in their wallet, you know, some of it into the bank. Okay, whatever. okay. 
with the older ones, I encourage them to keep a log book because I'm not great at keeping track of their hours okay. and they should learn to keep track of their hours. Okay. So like with my 11 year old and my 12 year old, like they are expected to keep track of their hours and then ask me to pay them. Okay. And I don't do it on a real regular basis. It kind of depends on like how much they've been working, but mm -hmm. awesome. Okay. That's, their, that's kind of on them if they want to get paid. No, that's a cool, uh, cool way to do it. And, uh, yeah, that's awesome. No. Right. And I think that's great skills that you're teaching them, too, when you get them involved in the actual construction projects as well. You know, they're learning these valuable lessons. Uh, right. They should be paying us for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have some friends who aren't really handy. Uh -huh. and I always tell them, like, you know, so and so friend, he can't do this. Do yeah. you want to grow up and be not able to change your own bike tire? No, yeah. I don't want to change my own bike tire. I'm like, well, then you're going to practice now. You're going to change your own bike tire. So I'm curious, Jordan, how did you learn all your skill set for construction? Um, so I, I think very mechanically. I think that's just part of it. Mm -hmm. But um, my, my dad was super handy, mm -hmm. and he never thought of a project that he couldn't finish, mm. you know. Whether he knew how to do it or not, and this is before YouTube, so you couldn't exactly fake it as easy as you can now. Right. But he would he would just start something and then figure out how to finish it, and he would sometimes sit there and you know you got to move your hat back when you try to figure <laughs> it out like this, and then now you got it, now you got it. It's all there. <laughs> so, yeah. A lot of that. Um, we're pretty. We're undeterred by an obstacle. Uh -huh. I think that's that runs in our family pretty well. So. That's one of those things like Amazing. I don't know so how you... to change a water pump on a car. You change the first one and now you do know how to change wow. a water pump. So on you're self-taught in a lot of these skills. Oh, very much. Very much so. I mean, I had the example, I think, from my dad. Mm -hmm. But then like he didn't do stuff on cars or, you know, he wasn't that, you know, on that kind of mechanical side mm -hmm. of it. He was more on the industrial construction side and mm -hmm. things like that. But like I picked up all the cars and all of my engineering background. You know, you just you figure it out as you go. Um, I program now. So I think a lot of that is the same kind of stuff. So you just learn, you know, once you learn how to program once, then you can learn the new language and you can program in a new language and things like that as well. So, right. So it sounds like you're a lifelong learner. You're constantly growing and, and developing your skill set, And that's a really valuable model for your kids to see. Yeah. Are you noticing them picking up on some of that independent learning drive as well? I'm a kid. <laughs> yeah, it, it's different for all the kids. So that's one of the things. Like, I don't, ha I don't have five kids that are, you know, cookie cutter mold or anything like that. Well, one of the kids isn't, you know, even, not even our DNA, you know. So you get a whole different, you know, roll of the dice there, I guess. Sure. But um, I, I think we're going to be able to get some aspects of it are going to show up in all the kids. It's going to be different for each kid. What's gonna, what's gonna stick? Um, so I have two that are ferocious readers so mm -hmm. they'll read anything mostly just trashy teenage stuff but <laughs> they'll, they'll a lot read, of harry potter yeah a lot of harry potter <laughs> they'll read they'll read anything so that's a way i that, love that harry wasn't potter. how i <laughs> i mean i think harry potter is great i don't like percy jackson yeah, as much they're whatever. really in a percy jackson phase now so. i have a lot of like practical books that i'd like them to read but it's hard to get them to read the richest stuff. man in babylon hey. yeah I, at least I, they're I made them. they all read the richest man in babylon oh yeah, yeah. That's That's really, yeah. yeah. um so uh reading wasn't uh, reading is not a good way for me i struggle with reading i probably was learning disabled if i had gone to real school they would have put me in with all the slow kids or whatever but i wasn't slow i just don't read mm -hmm. i mean it's super hard for me to read so that's not a way I, I really attain new information very well. I'm much more of a hands-on doer kind of thing. But we're, one of my kids is like that, and then two of them are more readers. Um, are some you of them, with the little ones yet? Yeah, they're, they're still little. Some of them are handy, and some of them you know, are still we'll see, I guess. But uh, no, I, I think, I think if they get enough exposure, yeah. I'm trying to teach them how to think. And problem solve. Life, life's a big problem. And if you can't think your way out of a problem, then... You're going to have a lot of a lot of trouble with life. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. So what do you guys like to do for fun as a family? Well, uh, one fun thing that we've done the last several summers is go for these hikes up in Isle Royale in um, Lake Superior. Mm -hmm. okay. island way, way up high. So we've been backpacking. Um, Jordan and Jordan went with some friends and then Jordan and I went and then Jordan took Ada, our oldest daughter, for a few days and then... Um, we Man, we, and when we, Jordan and I went again with some other friends. Uh, we just love it up there. It's like total 
um, wilderness. wilderness wow. And you carry everything and you fill the <laughs> water and the whole bit. And that's been a huge fun thing for us that we've really enjoyed and really want to do more of. That's um, awesome. So whole, you go on multiple day wilderness excursions, like a week, camping, yeah. Yeah. Eating. Oh, sweet. Wow. It takes a long time to plan it, and you can really only do one or two of them a year. But mm-hmm. um, it's something we've looked forward to and had a super blast doing. So we want to do more <laughs> of that with our kids. That's pretty epic. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. And then um, we work on our house for fun, and we chop and stack wood for fun, mm-hmm. and we and uh, for heat, yeah. and for heat, <laughs> fun and heat. <laughs> uh, we have a really nice. All the beaches around here are obviously super nice, and it's not salt water, and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. So um, we do we do beach sports. We do walk on the beach. Uh, we love picking fossils and all those. Try kind not of to things. be in the sun. So yeah, we yeah. Go like in the evening the and. Sometimes in the early morning, but not more often in the evening. So mm-hmm. that's kind of stuff that we enjoy. And yeah, you guys have tw- you guys have twenty acres. What do you do with all that acreage? Um, so clear it. yeah, it was it was a <laughs> firewood. Abandoned. Need that firewood. <laughs> all right. Yeah, it was. Uh, it had a fire in the '60s. There was a house fire, and then they fixed it, but they never quite got it back up to speed again. So the fields have overgrown, the grapes have overgrown, all the fences, you know, fell down, and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's a distressed asset mm. and we are we're working to undistress it mm. is there is there any work. goals there like i don't know making yeah us... there's there's tons of goals um i mean we're working on the house now so we're putting on it was only a, I guess it was probably only a three bedroom when yeah. we moved here we, we kind of added another bedroom you know whatever turned some space over to another bedroom to get us up to four at least Mm-hmm. Uh, but we're putting on some more space right now uh, so we can get our, we are one bathroom household right now with oh, seven man. people. <laughs> so we're trying to get. Can't it. wait to have another bathroom. Yeah. We know that great. pain. When we lived with his parents, my in-laws, yeah. there's nine of us in one, one bathroom. bathroom. That yeah. was rough. You just got to schedule your showers. It's not that bad. I uh, just pee in the backyard. <laughs> right. There is some of that. <laughs> <laughs> There is something in the backyard. So I'm, yeah, I'm so. curious to know, you know, because that's kind of our goal, too, is to buy, like, you know, some property, some land. Yeah. And um, I'm just curious, what are the goals there? Is this kind of like your Do dream you want a house? Farm? Um, I, farm. I would I would be into raising animals, certain animals. Um, I don't really need to, like, plow and, you know, mm-hmm. cut corn and hay and stuff like that, except, mm-hmm. you know, maybe for the animals. We'll see how that goes. Uh, we had on our seven acres before we had blueberries. Nice. Uh, we had probably 300 blueberry bushes, something like that. Nice. Wonderful. Yeah. So we're going to plant some bl- blueberries here. Well, that's on the list. Um, this is big enough to have four wheel tracks, and it's got a little creek going through it, which we could nice. dam up maybe and have some fun with that. <laughs> We've always talked about like a natural pool, you know, one of those mm-hmm. uh, big swampy things. Mm-hmm. Well, some stuff like that. <laughs> but yeah, four wheel tracks, uh, you know, really beautiful. a shooting range. Uh, we want a couple of these like. Um, I guess they'd be like tiny houses, but we wouldn't use them really as tiny houses. Mm-hmm. To rent out as like Airbnbs? No, more for just like quiet space. So you go okay. go play guitar by yourself somewhere. But we could put them up, you know, because it's 20 acres, you can put them up all over. But every you could every child gets their, their tree house or their... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go, go off and do your own thing. <laughs> That's fun. So some stuff like that. Um, but yeah, just reclaiming it back from the wilderness because mm-hmm. wilderness takes over pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Right. So I bought a backhoe and I've done a lot of clearing with the backhoe, which the backhoe is like the perfectly wrong tool for almost every job that you have to do. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's not an excavator and it's not a bulldozer and it, you know, it's not a loader. It's not a forklift, but it can almost do all of those activities. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> um, so uh, in your homeschooling journey and your free time, do you plan to do any family traveling? Um, any ambitions for that? Um, so we've, really like going on trips without our kids Uh and I don't know like I know there's a lot of homeschool families who really like traveling with their kids Mm -hmm. that so far has not been the way we work but we do uh we we the last two years we've done a week-long trip to Florida with some friends that Mm -hmm. we've really had a great time at Mm -hmm. and um that's all of us and uh, it's a blast. And then Thanksgiving. Is and then we do a full week of Thanksgiving down with Jordan's family in Virginia. So we do those two weeks. Mm-hmm. So like once you add it up and we start talking about all the travel, I guess like we take our kids like about half the time and 
Yeah, trying to not take our kids to that half the time, I guess. No plans for Europe or Puerto <laughs> no, Rico. No, Jordan doesn't like really that. fit in a plane. He's like yeah. six foot four. <laughs> and, Way too big um, for a plane. <laughs> neither one of us enjoy air travel, and we think Michigan is so great. So we do a lot of um, exploring in Michigan. Uh huh. Nice. Well, you know, I think that's an interesting dynamic when you when you're a homeschool family. Unlike most, you're together twenty four seven. So right. you appreciate more and perhaps even your kids appreciate the change up of time away, time with grandparents yeah. and you having time as just your couple because it's, it's right. far. So the last few summers, my between. mom's taken each kid for a week at their, uh, they have a house near a lake mm-hmm. and she just take a, take one kid for a week. And it's a totally different dynamic with the four remaining kids. Mm-hmm. Because everybody interacts with each other a little bit differently, and then we lose a different kid, and that kid comes home. <laughs> it's actually kind of fun, like just getting a little bit of different time with. And each she kid. gets the kids with their actual personality because yeah. we only see them when they interact. You know, you see the. They're very the different, different when they're all interacting. Yeah. Survival yeah. mode. <laughs> right. But right. if it's just the one kid, then it's way different look. Yes. You know. And what amazing memories they're able to build with their grandparents that way, you know. Yeah, that's yeah. Really nice. Something that's um, going to last And then uh, for their birthdays, I've been trying to do more individual time with them and go out and do something. So, like, I, I took uh, I took Ada hiking. Mm-hmm. I took Waylon camping. Mm-hmm. Gunner didn't want to go by himself. He wanted to go play video games or whatever. He just stuck his head in the back there. <laughs> so we did that. But, yeah, no, I'm trying to find the stuff that they actually like to do and do a little bit more directed time uh-huh. Uh, for things like that and it's obviously different and every year it'll be a little different but yeah. I, we have the flexibility now with the time and and the money as well so that's yeah. awesome so i feel like you guys have been so intentional in your journey and uh i just kind of want to ask wrapping up here like what is some of the best advice you have for just young couples or families starting out uh, one thing that i thought of uh we used to do and we don't do it so much anymore but we do a little bit so we do um we used to like do a planning meeting once a week where we'd like sit down and figure out like what our week was going to look like and which nights we're going to be home and um, which nights we're going to be working on the project and what are we trying to accomplish this week. And that was really valuable for us for a long time of like trying to just like go at this week together. And the I guess what sort of replaced it now is that we um, do a family breakfast every day instead of like family dinner because our kids swim and swim practice happens at the exact same time as dinner should happen so Mm -hmm. um so we like have an actual cooked breakfast every morning with everybody and uh jordan and i usually kind of just talk through our day then and i braid his hair for him and (laughs) kind of like get things going that way and that's been a really good connection Mm -hmm. point for us so um just trying to like schedule those connection things Mm -hmm. and we do we have like regular standing date night it's every tuesday nice we have a babysitter that comes like it's really important to us to Mm -hmm. do that time and so like that's just been a really great thing we've probably done that for i don't know we've had date night for a long time so what what have been some good date nights i mean it typically involves menards (laughs) what is menards (laughs) It's like a home improvement store. Like uh, okay. We've Depot. had those date nights before. <laughs> Just walk around are... Home Depot. <laughs> right. Then on Tuesdays, it's half price wings at Buffalo Wild Wings. So nice. we usually go and get half price wings and then hit up the Menards. And um, that's what we do for fun. Grocery nice. shopping. We grocery shop we together. Grocery shop now. together because I hate grocery How shopping fun. and Jordan doesn't mind it. So <laughs> he comes with. Well, it's totally different when the kids aren't with you. You can actually enjoy right. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think we're way more efficient grocery shoppers when I'm in grocery shopping. <laughs> yeah. I want to be there. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the great. things I think, I mean, I've heard it in some of the other episodes, I know, but your marriage comes first when you're married. Uh, I mean, I love my kids and everything, mm-hmm. but they're going to see how much I love them by how much I love Leah and agreed, how much we're going to put into our marriage. So I think, I think people get that wrong mm-hmm. and they... You know, like, I got to care for my kids. And it's like, well, you, you got to, but you got to stay healthy on your marriage first. So mm-hmm. we do invest a lot of that mm-hmm. uh, emotionally and spiritually and physically, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and money. Yep, yep. We, you we know, spend money on date night because we need it. We need, we need it. it. It doesn't, it just doesn't roll by itself. Um, right. So that was a good thing. 
Uh, the advice. Five Love Languages is a great book. We, you know, we've read that a lot as well. Mm-hmm. The, another thing that worked out really when we were getting started, because I get home from work, you know, back when we were newly married or whatever, and she'd have all of her list of things, but I've been working all day. <laughs> so we needed that decompressed time. We live really close to wherever I've worked too. Uh-huh. So never more, it's never been 20 minutes even. 19 minutes yeah. was the furthest away I ever lived. Wow. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a lot of, like now it's like three minutes, you know. Nice. <laughs> less. You know, yeah, so it's crazy. You don't get any decompression time in three minutes. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we had this 20 minute rule where it was 20 minutes, you know, when we get, when I, either of us would get home from work, actually, when we were both working. But just that, that built in decompression time, uh, that was a really good thing. And then once you have kids, it kind of went out the window. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to ask that. Are the kids trained to, to no, give mommy no, and daddy no. that time? or <laughs> You got to adapt. You got to come up with a different way. Yeah. I, I love how I tell my kids, mommy just needs 10 minutes mm-hmm. of space yeah. to relax. Oh, my bathroom breaks have okay. gotten a lot longer at home, you know. <laughs> no, it doesn't take one me minute later, to to is this 10 minutes yet? Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice. Awesome. Well, those are great tips. I really appreciate hearing you say that, um, and I appreciate how you're 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 living that that lifestyle. You know, just yeah, putting the marriage first. It it says more than words could ever say to your kids about feeling secure, feeling loved, and seeing an example to model their future life after. Right. So. Awesome. Um, so just real quick, because I feel like maybe you guys can share that. I know, Jordan, you say don't read a lot, but is there any resources, quotes that you guys kind of live by or really like to share? I, I try to read a lot. It's just hard. I'm not a great reader. So I, I do read, but it's not not like fun like she does. She can I read. read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she can do three or four books a week. I can't, can't touch that. <laughs> wow. Um, so I don't know how books. you find the time for that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all the great ones, uh, Millionaire Next Door was very inspirational for us, uh, just because it really put, it put that, you have that type of person in your brain, and you, you have them pegged for everything, mm-hmm. and you think a million bucks buys you a jet and all of that, well, mm-hmm. like, a million bucks doesn't even buy you a jet, much less a life where you could use a jet, <laughs> right. you know, but you think about stuff differently, and when, when you, when you read that, that really helped, uh, reset some of our expectations and then we saw like there's this one couple we're like we read the book and we're like oh that's them, that's so them. you know and like so they're obviously wealthy because they they pulled all those things in so that was a that was a good one early on uh-huh. um that was one yeah. of my favorites too millionaire next door yeah no i really like that uh, one. um rich dad poor dad for me just reset my understanding of like what having a job versus owning a job versus like putting your money to work for you Mm. what what those different categories meant because growing up i would have never thought of anything other than having a job Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so like it just is amazing to think of like what how how your mind mindset can shift to um your money does the work for you but then yeah that so we you know there's that level of just going to work and having a job but then you get that next level, like, oh, I'm self-employed. Really, you just bought yourself a job, and you're not really any different than the ones that just go to work. So that was that. That was our progression along the line. So at some point, we picked that up, and we're like, we got to come up with a different way, you know, and send all of our little, uh, you know, copper coins out to, to make work? silver coins or whatever, mm-hmm, you know, things mm-hmm. like that. So yeah, and then obviously, richest man in Babylon. We talked about that one already. That was really a great one. Mm-hmm. What else? You know, my favorite books are novels. She so. likes the novels. What's your What's your favorite novel? Les Miserables. Really? That's your favorite? Yeah. Okay. Oh, man. It's a it's long like the, one. The most redemptive story with the most interesting characters and um, just, I don't know, it's just so beautiful and I love the, the there's a, even if you didn't read the whole book, if you only just read the first like 150 pages, it's about this bishop. Just the mindset of that guy and how charitable he is and how little he can live on and how much he wants his life to glorify God. Like, I just really like love that character mm. and want to pattern my life after parts of that character. So that's been a really influential book for me. I've read it several times. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I, on the other hand, I think that Malcolm Gladwell, it might be the smartest human being alive right now. <laughs> so I'm in a full Malcolm Gladwell consumption mode. So I'm trying to read all the books and listen to all the podcasts and everything. But his way of thinking about just common issues is so different than what you get from mainstream media or from 
you know, just a general population. And I love the contrarian part of that. So mm -hmm. I'm naturally inclined to be a little uh, oppositional, and I really like that. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, uh, just wrapping up here, when people hear your story, you know, they hear the work you're putting in and the, the life you're building and designing and growing, um, what do you hope to get inspired by or to do? I mean, I, I think about life, there's obstacles that come up. Everybody get, hits with some hard stuff. Um, but it's really how you're going to respond to that and how you're going to work, work around some of those issues. So, you know, you can, you can lose your job, your factory can get moved to North Carolina, you know, bad things can happen. But if you can set yourself up in a position where you say, okay, now I reset, recover, what am I going to do to move forward on this? How am I going to get over this? Somebody else has obviously found a way to get around this specific problem. Let me pull in some additional resources and then work, work through some of this. That's what I'd love for people to see. When I, when I go to hire people, I used to do a lot of technical hiring. And that was one of the things I always looked at is, can this person get to a roadblock and then find a way around a roadblock? Because that's really that's really what life is. It's it's problem solving, whether it's a complex problem or a simple problem. You got to figure out how to get over some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And with the right resources and the right frame of reference, I think you can get over it. Or you know, I can come and help you or anything like that. I love I love to solve other people's problems too, not just my own. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for that. You've had such an inspiring and unique and interesting story. Um, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed this interview. Um, <laughs> If anyone wanted to reach out to you, how could they get in touch? Do you have a, a way that people can reach you? Yeah, so uh, we're on Facebook. I think it's Leah Jordan Clint on Facebook. We like share on Facebook yeah, like we're 70 we're years old. old. <laughs> uh, With your AOL you that, email. You're that, that, big you're that harmonious. Presence, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> slow adopters. We're slow adopters. Um, I do have a I do have another Facebook page. I think that's how it's That's how, how I reached out to you. Uh, yeah. found me. Uh, that's called... It's not just about me and my dream of doing nothing, which is mostly just funny stuff and a little bit of the of, of the FI stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm on LinkedIn too. If you give me a personal message on either of those places and you want to talk, I'd love to text you. Texting would be my easiest thing, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to give out my phone number right, right now. So if you uh, follow up with me and then we can text and whatever, and I'd love to help people out or um, work through some problems. Um, the last From that last podcast, I had a couple of people call me up about specific rental questions and how how to source some rental properties and stuff like that so i'd love to give my advice that's out there mm -hmm. um we're other places too you could probably find us on twitter and yeah we're just bigger pockets and instagram um, but we don't, don't do we don't do a lot of that stuff so but yeah i'd love to text you if something you're really interested in and, and we can work through something and maybe meet up and do all the cool stuff awesome well, do Jordan. the bike interview yeah, yeah, we gotta do that bike interview at some point <laughs> definitely do the trying bike to revive our bike <laughs> podcast or blog yeah I'll, I'll, I'll have to share that in the intro to the show because uh, I don't think a lot of people know about that yes. it was in but, the uh, other episodes <laughs> Jordan and Leah thank you so much for joining us on the Fan Vester podcast it's been a real pleasure I think you've definitely given us some real strong insights and some things to think about and uh, just uh, a lot of inspiration from all that you've done everything you've grown and just the amazing lifestyle you've created for yourself so thank you so much for joining us and i uh, can't wait to uh, chat more with you in the future thanks thanks for having us